These are the notes on acids and bases, part four. Remember, there is more than one way to define an acid, and there is more than one way to define a base. But the default definition, the one we usually use, is the Arrhenius definition. And that is that an acid generates hydronium in solution, and a base generates hydroxide in solution. What they do when they're not in solution. Hmm. So we have another definition that takes care of that problem. What if they're not in solution, among other things? What if they're not even in aqueous form and so on? And that is the Bronsted Lowry definition. Okay, good luck, good luck pronouncing that correctly. And that is that an acid is a proton donor and a base is a proton acceptor. That makes it sound like a base is a charity case and it's accepting free donations from the acid, but it's not quite so nice and civil as we've mentioned. The acid doesn't want to lose its proton. It just can't help it. It's not strong enough to keep its proton. Remember that a proton is a hydrogen ion, right? And a base doesn't just get it in the mail from UPS or FedEx or whatever. It goes and grabs that proton. So when it says acceptor, well, that is an understatement. It gets it. It's a go-getter, okay? So acids lose, bases win, if you're talking about protons. So I like to say that an acid's very weakness becomes its strength. And I do realize that if Yoda were actually saying this, that the syntax would be garbled, would be switched around. But, oh well. So an acid's very weakness becomes its strength. What do I mean by that? I mean, if it's a weak molecule, like it's not held together that well, well, then it's going to get ripped apart. And that makes a very strong acid. It makes a very potent, powerful acid, let's say, right? Because the more it dissociates, which is fall apart, basically, the more hydronium is generated. And hydronium is the real behind the scenes agent of the acid. It is the avatar, if you will. It is the worker that does everything that acids get credit for. It's a shame that it doesn't get that much credit. Okay, why do acids do the thing they do all the things they do? Hydronium. So when it comes to water, well, that's a little tricky because water kind of does both. Water makes hydronium. Water makes hydroxide when it self ionizes. You don't need anybody around to make this happen. Oh, if you have 100% pure water, let's say if you could, then water would do this to itself. This is water's dirty little secret. It self ionizes. Okay, so that means you can never, ever, 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 ever have pure water. It is impossible to have pure water. That's what this means. So what's the name for that? Something that can make hydronium sometimes and hydroxide other times. It can kind of do one or the other. What is the name for that? Oh yeah, amphoteric, amphoteric. So that's a tricky technical word, but it basically means a chemical that can act as an acid or it can act like a base. By the way, it cannot do both at the same time. So notice that one of these water molecules is acting as the acid, the other one is acting as the base. Now it might be a little bit deceptive about which one is doing which role, but if you looked at them and then you assume that they wind up in the same position on the right side, well then it's actually the one on the right, the one that is sort of Mickey Mouse ears up, right? That winds up being the acid, why? Because it donated a proton, didn't it? And then the one that accepted the proton, the one on the left that looks kind of like upside down or Mickey Mouse ears down, that would be the one that's acting like a base. Why? Because it's accepting a proton. That's the one that becomes hydronium. So it is a little confusing, like, wait, so the one that is acting like the base is the one that becomes the hydronium, which is the acid? Wait a second. Well, that's just what happens. When you gain a proton, well, then you often become a conjugate acid. Remember that Hydronium is the conjugate acid of water, whereas hydroxide is the conjugate base of water. 
very tricky, right? I know it can be a little bit confusing because it almost seems backwards, but I said it right. What I said is correct. So what about a neutralization? Well, think about this. Acids and bases are both kind of like monsters. They're both like evil chemicals. They're the kind of chemicals that people say, let me stay away from chemicals, right? When they give those warnings, keep children away from chemicals. They're the kinds of chemicals that give chemicals a bad name. Even though many chemicals are fairly safe or perfectly safe, you could argue water, right? H2O, unless you can't swim. Okay, or if it's boiling hot. Well, anyway, some chemicals aren't as bad as they sound. But acids and bases are kind of definitely more hazardous chemicals. And they're both around in the world. You find them here and there. But you know, you don't find a lot of them. And I wonder why. I wonder why we don't find giant lakes full of acid outside of Indonesia. You actually do find them in Indonesia. Okay, um, or giant vats of base just lying around naturally. Well, that is because there's a really nifty trick that acids and bases do. It's kind of like Autobots and Decepticons. They're constantly fighting each other and taking each other out. So you never wind up with a clear victory on either side. So what happens is these two monstrous chemicals, the acid and the base, both very hazardous. And, and in some ways, I would argue that bases, despite the word on the street, are actually the more hazardous chemical in a lot of cases. They will take each other out. They will knock each other down. And why is that? Because they will neutralize each other. Okay. And all neutralizations are really the same exact reaction, the same thing. Because remember when I told you the secret that acids, all they really do is make hydronium by falling apart. That's all they do. They get all this credit. And bases, all they do is one way or another, by hook or by crook, they make hydroxide, right? So what's a neutralization really? It's hydronium and hydroxide reacting. And hydronium and hydroxide reacting well, they potentially could produce two water molecules. All you have to do is swap over that little hydrogen ion over to the hydroxide and boom, boom, you've got two water molecules, see on the right. And water, as we said, is a relatively safe chemical. So that is what is really happening in a neutralization. Acids and bases will neutralize each other when they are in equal concentrations. When you have the same amount of each, they take each other down, like Godzilla and King Kong knocking each other down and then both are defeated. Well, I don't know who's going to win, but let's just say that they're both eliminated from the picture. Oh, I hope that's not a spoiler. I have no inside knowledge if that is, by the way. But we don't usually show an acid-base neutralization that way. Because typically when we write a chemical equation, we kind of write it like the one we have down here in the middle, HCl plus NaOH. That means hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide. So wait a second, where's the hydronium? Where's the hydroxide? Where are the real agents of the acid and base? Well, we usually kind of leave those out, which is sad. They don't get the credit they deserve, okay? So what's gonna happen here? Well, the hydrogen from the HCl, watch, is gonna go and swap places with the sodium in the NaOH, and then see on the right how that makes it a water. And then the sodium wants to stick to the chloride. And then you wind up with NaCl. What do we call that? NaCl. What's the other name for that? Our everyday name for that? You might put it on your food. Oh, yeah, that is regular table salt. That is your everyday typical salt. It's not just the salt that chemists call salt. It's the salt that everybody calls salt. Okay. And water. Salt, water, salt, water. Oh, that's salt water. That's like the ocean. So whenever you have an acid-base neutralization, one way to look at the products, this is notice this is a different way of looking at it, is salt and water, okay? And you can also think of the sodium chloride as being spectator ions. And why would I say that? Because, well, you know what? Even this isn't entirely true. Well, I know we're leaving out the hydronium and hydroxide. The other thing this is leaving out is that the sodium and the chloride are not gonna be together in an ionic bond, they're gonna be separated in an aqueous solution. But this is the way that chemists look at a solution. They look at it as a sodium chloride solution. 
so they call it sodium chloride. So I know this is a little tricky. It's like looking at different levels of understanding. You could argue that this is the very basic level. This is the very simplistic version. A lot of things that are shown here are not entirely accurate, right? And then if you show the hydronium and the hydroxide reacting, well, that's on a little bit of a deeper level. And then guess what? There's even a deeper level still, deeper than that, and that is talking about oxidation reduction reactions and things like that. There's a whole, there's many, many levels of chemistry, levels that we can look at a reaction. So just keep in mind that a lot of acid-base neutralization reactions are written like this, where you don't even see the hydronium or the hydroxide, and just realize that the typical products of an acid and base neutralization are salt and water. Now it doesn't have to be regular table salt. It could be any ionic compound, but in this case it really is regular salt and water. Salt, water. So we can see that here. Here's my little animated version. Here we have an HCl that was just plopped into a solution of water, plopped into a whole bunch of water molecules. And then of course, it's not a very strong molecule because it's an acid. Remember, that's what it means. Its weakness becomes its strength because water can just rip that apart. Like so. And then when water rips it apart, now you've got hydronium. Look, the one above the Cl, that's hydronium, isn't it? So now that's going to start doing the things that acids do. But then you've got that little bystander chloride you know what, that doesn't do too much, just floats around. Maybe if you evaporated the water later, it might do something, but just floats around. That's what we mean by spectator ions. And let's look at a base, the dissociation of a base. Well, that's almost the same thing, at least if it's this kind of base, at least if it's a Arrhenius base. Now, Bronsted-Lowry bases we've talked about generate hydroxide in a different way, but let's just look at this one for simplicity's sake, okay? Just to make it easier for us. Well, guess what? It's gonna dissociate, why? Because the water molecules are gonna rip it apart. Remember, water molecules pull on everything. And if something isn't tough enough, if it's not as strong as a water molecule, it's gonna get ripped apart, like so. And haven't we just generated hydroxide? Which is why sodium hydroxide is considered a base. Now, sodium hydroxide is a very good base, almost every single NaOH in the sodium hydroxide will dissociate when put into solution. So it's what we consider a very strong base. In fact, it's something that people use to clean out their drain pipes. It'll clean out your drain pipe, okay? Literally. So the dissociation of an acid and a base we've seen, what about if we put them both in together? Let's watch this. Now we've got HCl, let's say this is the moment after we plunk them into the water just a, a microsecond later. Well, they're going to very, very quickly. What's the word for that? Oh, yeah. Dissociate. They dissociate. So now we've got hydronium and hydroxide. Oh, so we've got acid and base. Huh, interesting. Well, it turns out the only thing you need to do to take both of those hazardous chemicals out is this very, very tiny thing. One of the tiniest things you can do in chemistry, other than moving around electrons, this is one of the smallest changes you could possibly make, and yet it takes away the danger of the acid, it takes away the danger of the base. It's like two monsters, but they knock each other's teeth out. They take each other, well, they claw each other's fangs off. I don't know how to say it. You know what I mean. So watch what happens. Bloop. So now, look, it turned into water. So now where's the acid? Where's the base? Gone, neutralized. Now you should realize that this isn't the whole story because obviously, well, this is a little bit cartoony. Obviously atoms don't have letters on them and they're not bright colors. And it wouldn't just be one of each. It would be in the quintillions, you know, sextillions of them. But basically this is true. The hydronium and hydroxide take each other down. They knock each other down. And what you're left with is a safe solution of salt water, okay? However, don't forget that you know water ionizes itself. So even if you do get down to this, where you get back to, let's say, 100% water with some spectator ions between it, you know some of those waters are gonna self-ionize. 
but that is not a large number as we've seen. That is not a huge number. It's 1.0 times 10 to the negative 7 molarity of that you will find of each hydronium and hydroxide. That is a very small amount, actually. So most water molecules will be H2O, but it will always generate a tiny bit of that sneaky hydronium and that nasty hydroxide. So these are the two ways of looking at an acid-base neutralization. One way is to be pure, to talk about what's really happening. It's hydronium and hydroxide taking each other down, turning back into water. That is the exact reverse of the self-ionization of water. Think about it. That is the deionization of water. That is like the restoration of water, putting the water back together from its parts, from its ripped apart parts, right? And again, below that in the red, you can see that in the red outline, you can see the way we normally show this. And notice that this skips the step of dissociation. It skips right from the initial products, ignoring the water that was already there, showing you the final products and actually not even, because as you know, the sodium chloride would not be intact unless you were to, let's say, evaporate all the water around it. Well, then it would form salt. That's what happens, by the way, when an ocean dries up. When an ocean dries up, you're left with a big salt deposit, like they find at the bottom of the Mediterranean, which is actually evaporated many times. Okay, so this is two different ways of looking at acid-base neutralizations, and there are more, but these are the ones we're gonna stick with. So make sure that you understand what's happening in both of them. They're really just different points of view on the same exact process. So what if we were to do this in a very, very controlled way? What if we were to do this in such a way that we could measure how much of each one we put in, okay? And then gradually, gradually add them together until they neutralize each other at what we call the equivalence point. At the equivalence point, you have the same number of hydronium and hydroxide. And if they are in the same number, okay, or the same concentration, as you know from solutions, they will knock each other down, boom, 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 brrr, all the way down to nothing. But then, of course, water will generate some of them on its own. So you'll always have that background rate. That background rate, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 molarity. If you take the negative logarithm of that, what would you get? You should know this. What would the negative logarithm of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 be? Oh, yeah, it would be 7. So what would the pH be? if you were in a neutralized solution, after an acid and base had been put in in equivalent amounts, it would be pH seven. Now there are exceptions to this, but we're not gonna have time to go into that. There are times when you can reach equivalence when it's not pH seven, but I don't really wanna deal with that. So for the labs we're doing, for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna act as if that is the point you reach. You might read about this a bit and there's a little more to it than that, it might be a little bit off, okay? But for the most part, when they're in equivalent amounts, they take each other down, and then all you have is the background rate that you would have had anyway. So that is true, okay? So let's just say it's always at seven, even though if you read deeper, you'll find that there are exceptions to that. Okay, we're not gonna deal with that in this class. So the equivalence point can be reached, let's say you start out with, a, with an acid, with a very low pH, remember acids have pHs below seven. Let's say a pretty strong acid, pretty concentrated as well, where your pH is less than one. Notice way over on the left, notice how that's a little bit below the one, so that'd be between pH zero and pH one, okay? Well, if I started pouring base into that, well, what would happen? The base would generate hydroxide, the hydroxide would neutralize some of that hydronium. But you know what? It would take me a long time to change a pH. Do you remember that pHs are logarithmic? So that means if you're gonna change by even one pH, you have to change by a factor of 10. In other words, I would need to neutralize 90% of the original hydronium to change by one measly pH. So it might take a while to do that. So when you're pouring in your base, this is called a titration, you add a little base, 
there's a very tiny change in the pH. You add some more base, let's say you add five milliliters, 10 milliliters, 15 milliliters, but you're not seeing much change. So you're like, well, I might as well just dump it in there. But actually you better be careful because what's gonna happen is when you do reach the 90%, you will see a change of pH by one. And then to make the next change of pH, all you have to do is get rid of, let's say, 9% of the original to make another change by a factor of 10. And it'll change another pH. And then after that, all you have to do is change by 0.9% of the original. So it'll go faster and faster, then 0.09. So what's gonna happen is, you're gonna see very little change, very little change, very little change. You're adding base, you're adding base, 10 milliliters, 20 milliliters, 30 milliliters. And then all of a sudden, it changes like a rocket. It changes and skyrockets across the pHs going from one end of the spectrum, like let's say one or two, to the other end of the spectrum, let's say 12 and 13, right? So this is the tricky thing about titrations. And you will notice this when we do the titration that you really have to do it slowly and carefully to avoid overshooting the equivalence point. The equivalence point is gonna come very rapidly. At the point when the changes are happening, when you're changing pH, sometimes even one drop can change a pH. Sometimes even a fraction of a drop, let's say you can sort of split up drops with a burette, you can change one or more pH. So it goes faster and faster, and it's very, very easy to overshoot it. In fact, many times when we do a titration with students, a lot of times they overshoot the equivalence point and then they have to repeat the entire experiment from the beginning. So when I perform it, because I have more experience with this, I know to be careful, I know to be slow, and that's the way I'm gonna demonstrate it in the lab video, okay? But if you're doing the experiment yourself, just keep in mind, you have to go extremely cautiously to avoid overshooting it. The problem is that once you overshoot it, you don't know if you've overshot it by one drop or by a milliliter, or by a few milliliters. It's very hard to tell that. So what you really have to do is try to nail the equivalence point. Try to get it as exactly as you can. And that's the goal of what we call a titration. And I spoiled it, but this is called a titration. A titration is a gradual addition of one solution to the other to reach the equivalence point. Or I could have said one species to the other. So in other words, I could add base to acid to neutralize the acid. Well, it really neutralizes both of them, doesn't it? Or I could add acid to a base and neutralize the base because it really neutralizes both of them. So a titration can be performed either way. You can either neutralize the acid with the base or neutralize the base with the acid. The only problem is you need to know the concentration of one of them one of them needs to be the known concentration, okay? That is called the titrant. It is the one that you know the concentration of before you perform the experiment. And if you do that, you can figure out the concentration of the other, the unknown, okay? So titration experiments are one of the more technical things that we're gonna get into in high school chemistry. There's other way more technical things in the broad world of chemistry, but in terms of things we can deal with in high school chemistry, this is one of the more technical ones, for sure. So basically, a titration is finding an unknown concentration of an acid or a base by using a base or an acid of known concentration. The one that you know is your titrant. That's the one you know going in and then performing the experiment, you can figure out the other, okay? Doesn't matter which is which. If you know the base, you can figure out the acid. If you know the acid, you can figure out the base. Doesn't matter which one's which. Now this picture here is kind of a joke because you can't really do a titration that way. You can't just pour beakers together, okay? You're gonna overshoot it. Plus beakers are very, very bad for reading out volumes. They're very approximate. So that's not how we're gonna do it. That's not how we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it like this with some really nice titration apparatus. So what we call these things in a titration are the burette, that's the vertical, the very, very skinny, 
tube. It looks kind of like a graduated cylinder, and it kind of is. It's actually even more accurate than the very, very skinny graduated cylinders we sometimes use. So that is one of our most accurate volumetric instruments that we use in our labs, a burette, okay? And then underneath, that's a flask. Well, technically, that's an Erlenmeyer flask. There's various kinds of flasks. There's also Florence flasks that are round. But this is the one that we use typically in this class, so I'm just going to call it a flask. If you want to write Erlenmeyer flask, if you want to write that out in your lab report, you can. But if you call it a flask, that's fine. And using this very simple equipment, and we might need a few beakers to set things up. We might need a few you know, micro pipettes to do some drops in, might need some funnels. This is basically what we need for our titration. So once we have it set up, well, we can either put the base in the burette and then pour it into an acid, or we can put the acid in the burette and pour it into a base. It's up to you to figure out which one we're doing in our lab. You got to figure out which is which. Now, remember, it could be either way. The one thing you cannot do is you can't pour a base into another base. That doesn't work. Or an acid into another acid. But as long as you have both different species, if you have an acid or a base, it doesn't matter which one you put where, as long as you know the concentration of one of them. And you would need to know the volume of the one you know as well. You'd need to know its concentration and its volume, as you will see in the lab. So I made a separate video of titration examples, showing you how to do the calculations on paper. Because you kind of have to know how to do those calculations on paper before you can do the calculations for the actual lab experiment where you're getting real, authentic, real world measurements, okay? So the titration examples, there's several of them where I'm showing you the various ways you can calculate concentration or you can find something from the concentration. Um, I'll show you all the various um, permutations of these equations. So make sure to watch the titration examples, and then you will be better prepared for doing the titration lab. That is the end of the notes on acids and bases, part four. Make sure to watch the titration examples next.